Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Kyle Racky. He's the co-founder and CEO of a proposal software company called Proposify, not Proposify. That's what I usually get. Proposify. There we go. And today we're not talking about proposals because that would be, I thought, just a little bit too on the nose to have a proposal guy here and, and talk about proposals. We figure we're gonna we're actually gonna talk about Kyle's journey taking the product up market. It's something a lot of people have talked about. You, if you read anything, it, well, if you've read Impossible to Inevitable, if you've read any of Jason Lemkin's materials, you know, it's the number one, it's one of the number one things as you're growing a SaaS company is you want to move up market. If you're a greedy salesperson like myself or just a competitive salesperson that wants to sell more deals, um, obviously going up market is a very easy way. I shouldn't say easy way, is one of the ways for us to increase the size of our commission checks. So if you're either of those two camps, and I'm not, you know, slagging on you if you're greedy. I'm just saying I was maybe and wanted to sell the bigger deals because, you know, the glory and the bigger commission check. Um, moving up market is a pretty key piece of that. If you're stuck selling something that's $49 a month, it's going to be very challenging to to really hit those big MRR growth goals. If you're selling something that's, you know, 10 or 20 grand a month, that's a much, much better, uh, much easier way to get that, uh, to hit that number. So with that said, Kyle, welcome to the show. Hey, Colin. Thanks for having me. Man, I'm, I'm really excited. I've heard, I met a ton of your people at the, the inbound conference last year. Um, I've, I've heard good things about you through the Canadian sort of startup scene. And I uh, just got my, my notice for the, the next A-list meetup, which I'm sure you're on. Oh, well, I don't know, but no, maybe I should get on it. It's uh, the little Canadian made up of uh, startups, uh, startup entrepreneurs. I know they've got one in Halifax, so I'll shoot, shoot it your way. Yeah, I would love that. Beautiful. Um, basically I want to kick this off and just talk a little bit about what inspired you to move up, up market. And before we jump in, I'd love to understand what your sales team kind of looked like and what price point you were at before you jumped to, to that, uh, it, before you made the decision to go up market. Yeah. So, I mean, just a little, uh, background was that, um, and I think this probably explains why I resisted the move up market for a while, which was that I used to run an agency. That was my first business was running a web design and marketing uh, agency. And so I was used to the, the long sales cycles, the you know, bigger projects, but more kind of sporadic. Um, and so my, my co-founder and I were really excited when we started a SaaS company because we thought, great, no more sales, all self-serve, all recurring, all automated um, and we were really excited to just sell these small plans and just try to get them in volume. But then, you know, a few years into the business, we're doing a few million in, in ARR and we kind of realized like, okay, there's a reason a lot of SaaS companies move up market. It's because as, as you mentioned, um, you know, even from a founder's perspective or a CEO's perspective is, is that churn starts to kill you on those smaller plans. You don't notice it as much when you're about a million in ARR, but once you start getting bigger and you realize, oh no, we're churning through like nearly half of our customers every year, um, you start to try to find a way to plug that hole or plug that leaky bucket. And what I found was that as much as we worked on product, as much as we talked to our customers and tried to you know, figure that out, at the end of the day, um, we were just selling to tiny businesses. They went out of business or they didn't find a use for the product, or they wanted to kick the tires with another similar product like ours. And so, um, you know, we beat our head against the wall and really thought, okay, when we look at all the data, what we're finding is that even when we sell slightly larger customers, the churn is much better. The churn is usually in the negatives. The, you know, um, they seem to be mostly happy with the product. We just need to go out and find more of them. So that, that was kind of the hypothesis that kicked it off. Now, the actual transition ended up being much harder than we thought. What? It's, it wasn't as easy as, uh, as you sort of mapped it out to be? Big, big shocker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We were so naive. Yeah, it's funny. We do, um, I've talked about it a little bit on the show, so I won't go too deep into it, but we do a pricing experiment every year and usually around, around this time. And we've, had, we've done it almost every year since we started. And um, I'd say the majority of them have gone really well. Um, two of them have, one of them went, meh, didn't really have an impact. One of them had a negative impact. Um, okay. It actually inc increased our churn. Uh, and we found that was actually increasing our contract length, like decreased our, or increased our churn big time. People were mm. early, early days. 
Yeah. Pr- pricing is a huge one. And I, you know, I'm sure there, I know there's other stuff you want to go through, but like that was one of the big changes we had to make. Cause we found we were, we had capped our pricing mm-hmm. and there was no way to close that 50 K or whatever a year contract without um, really like figuring out what that price should be. And it's so easy to just stall out. You get stuck in the math of looking at it's the same numbers, it's the same numbers. And you, you almost miss that there's this whole other market opportunity. If you just move to a slightly bigger customer. Yeah. And there's always the fear of what if that customer doesn't exist? And so when, with your journey here, where did you start price wise when, when you started thinking about going up market? So we actually copied Basecamp, which is usually not a good idea. Nobody should do that. Basecamp's kind of in a, in a category of their own. We noticed that they actually had a price on their site that was like 3000 a year and it was their enterprise plan. And so we thought, oh, let's just try that. Um, and we sold a few of them. And, and actually what we realized was that we were leaving a lot of money on the table with some of those customers who paid 3000 a year um, because that's just not a lot. And it's, it's also too small a deal size to really build a sales team around. Mm-hmm. So we knew that we needed to find some kind of scalable pricing model that basically didn't have a cap. I think that's what a lot of SaaS companies like ourselves do is that you cap yourself and um, doing some work with price intelligently on the strategy side, we actually did what I thought we would never do because I've always hated per seat pricing, but through research and through um, you know their methodology of kind of figuring out what the market wants, we realized that for us per seat was just the way to go and it's and it actually has worked so far. That's great. We actually had, I was just trying to Google it while you're talking there. We had uh, Patrick Campbell on the show, mm. uh, episode 73, if anybody's uh, interested in checking it out. I love that guy. He's so smart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really big fan. And so, so you started back in the, so you went from a, it was a total a model of you pay for Proposify. There's no per seat. You did some research. You realized, okay, the per seat model gives you a whole bunch more upside. Um, so w- what did it look like before? Like 10 bucks a month, 20, 50, a hundred bucks a month. Yeah. We had like three plans. I think it was, um, at, you know, we experimented a lot with pricing and that was actually why we hired price intelligently. Cause we were like, okay, we can just throw more ideas at the, at the pricing page and see what sticks, or we can actually, you know, do go through the actual, the proper research process. So, uh, before it was, I think 25 was the starter that had, uh, we used to limit by proposal. So, if you had five proposals on the go, then you would pay 25. If you need more than that, you might pay 50 or 100. Uh, and then I think we had 250 a month or, or 3K a year was kind of our biggest plan. Um, all capped by proposals and then a few features would only move on to the bigger sets. That was the biggest change that Price Intelligently helped us figure out was that we went lower on the small end pricing. So only $19 a user, um, 49 per seat on the mid plan, and then the third tier was enterprise call for pricing. Gotcha. And I'm, I'm assuming that was a little bit more than 49 bucks a month. Uh, yeah. Although the, the thing that I realized and didn't know at the time is that once you get into those larger seat deals, they usually want a discount. So they almost are uh, trying to pay even less than your mid tier plan, but they have so many users that you'll take it. Yeah. The, it's always a balance of like, you almost need to just take the enterprise plan and pad it a little bit so that you can discount back down because you know that conversation's coming. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> and that's still a work in progress for us to figure out. Yeah. It doesn't really cost that much extra to build a sales force, you know, in integration. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That's the gateway, right? It's like, yeah. Oh, you want Salesforce integration? You're paying for the pro plan. And totally. And that's, yeah, that's actually what we're in the process of doing right now is moving just the Salesforce integration to the enterprise. Cool. Um, pretty, pretty common playbook. And so when I'm trying to think here, when we were, when you were just getting, just getting off the ground and you were, you know, when, when you were selling, you know, bef- when you were selling just per proposal, what did, what did the sales team look like there? So we started off once we kind of thought, okay, let's experiment with this model of having a sales team and, and trying to sell bigger deals. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we really just started with two sales reps. We hired two, a uh, one had come from like a startup sales experience and the other one was a little bit more of an enterprise and we were experimenting with the two. Um, we found that they could, they could definitely sell some deals. We weren't always sure if it's because they were smaller deals that they would have closed regardless because they were all coming from inbound. Um, but you know, we did start to see there was, there was some signs of success and we wanted to move further into that, that, that direction. We did, 
around the time that we raised our, our first um, kind of ma more major round of investment, it was when we decided to invest in a VP of sales and try to find somebody who'd come from big SaaS experience. So we, we found uh, somebody with Salesforce under her belt and um, basically gave her the keys to say, okay, we got the budget, we've got the person, let's go build the sales team. And this was actually, you know, there was a lot of, uh, going on at the time, but you, you know, I think that was a lesson that we had learned was that just because somebody has worked at Salesforce doesn't necessarily mean they know how to build that playbook from scratch. Um, and so it was a really difficult transition between just getting product and positioning where it needs to be, but also having uh, somebody who didn't really know how to build that playbook. It was, we ran into challenges. I'll, I'll double snap that big time because it's not even just like, the, the fact that they came out of Salesforce. I think it's big company with your, uh, what you're used to at a big company versus what you're used to at a small startup, right? If you're, if you're a big company VP or even director at sales, Salesforce, you're making one, you're making good money. Two, if you're a director level, you got a bunch of reports. You're not actually, you know, you're more of a people manager than you are a doer. And I think in an early stage startup, it sounds like you needed more of a doer. Yeah. Yeah. You need somebody who like, that's like, to your point, somebody who's come from Salesforce has had that brand behind them. They've had that massive infrastructure and product and everything else behind them. So, um, you know, I think, isn't it in, in your book, uh, uh, it talks about Mr. Dashboards mm -hmm. as being sort of like, yeah, that was, you know, that was kind of what we were looking at was somebody who knew how to run a sales team and look and, and maybe run reports, but not how to you know, really get in the weeds day to day and coach reps and, and figure out what the, you know, what the process should look like and how we're going to, you know, bring leads into the funnel and build pipeline. Mm -hmm. The process for what you learn there is the process of going from zero to one with a new team is dramatically different from the process of going, you know, a hundred to 200. Totally. Yeah. So, so talk to me about the early days. Like, what did, what did it look like sort of before you made the decision to, to go up market in terms of um, your sales process and, um, and sort of pre, pre that VP? Hmm. I mean, really, there wasn't a whole lot. It was me and my co-founder who were overseeing the two sales reps. We eventually hired a third one, uh, Scott, who's still with us today. And um, we didn't have a process, right? Like, yes. you know, Scott? No. Oh, <laughs> just cheering for him. <laughs> yeah, Scott's awesome. Um, yeah, like I think that was the thing. So Kevin and I didn't know what we were doing. So we basically just said, hey, guys, go figure it out. Um, and I think where we eventually got to, so a year, year and a half later, um, and I know I'm kind of fast forwarding on you a little bit, but I think this, this helps serve the point better, is that you know, when we realized things weren't working with, um, with our VP and with our sales team, it had grown to about 13 people. And there were segmented roles. There was SDRs and BDRs and AEs and even junior AEs. We had the whole, you know, <clears throat> the whole process that would have worked for a bigger SaaS company that was scaling and finding product market fit. We were trying to do that, I think, a little bit too early. And so um, we had hired this sales enablement manager named Daniel who you know, he, had, he hadn't really run a sales team, but he worked with CEOs to help them build sales teams from scratch you know, three times before zero to 1 million ARR. So still very small companies. But what he came in with was um, he started doing the things that I thought, sh you know, somebody should have been doing all along, which was listening to reps calls, um, coaching them, building uh, materials and training for them, building demo decks and scripts, and then analyzing the scripts and figuring out what's not working on calls and tweaking it. And that day-to-day -day sort of tweaking of the process, what we started to find was we're, we're actually starting to see some signs of success, but our team was just too big and it was too hard to build all that from scratch with such a big team. So we made the difficult decision to let them go. Um, and then, and then basically promote Daniel to leadership position and try to try to kind of reset and start over. Wow. And I did, I, I misspoke. I did actually meet Scott. I met him at the inbound conference last year. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. And so you swelled up to this big team. What was the, the total sort of rough size of that sales team? Yeah, it was, a, it was a 13 people. So we're not talking massive, but for us, it was big. And then you had to do, and, you, and like one of the hardest parts of, of hiring is going through all the work and then having to do a reset. Yeah, yeah. And I felt sorry, like our outbound BDR team, they were just kind of thrown into it. Like 
go find us leads and they, you know, they would find some good ones, but our product wasn't ready or we didn't have the right Salesforce integration. So, you know, they were just really beating their heads against the wall, trying to find some traction in the market. And we needed to kind of start at a, at a smaller, like grass, grassroots level and figure out what messaging, what positioning is working well before we try to scale up that BDR team. Hmm. So, so when you did decide to sort of take the, take the leap to, or take the next step, what, what were the big changes? It was, so like, my, I guess my thoughts on, on overall moving up market, we, we tend to put a lot of emphasis on the sales team and that's certainly a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing too, is that you can, if you're moving up market, I think you can make it really difficult for your sales team. If you're not also looking at how do you move the product up market? How do you build customer success? How do you figure out pricing and positioning? Those, those things alone are, um, either going to make your sales team really successful or really not successful. So we were trying to essentially do all this at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, this is a sales podcast. It's not a product podcast, but if you're, if all you're doing is changing pricing and then saying, okay, go sell this up market, your mm-hmm. salespeople are going to have a, a uphill battle in front of them. Absolutely. And the other, I mean, the other thing too, is you're, you're, you're trying to get your product team, your entire company has to be aligned, uh, aligned in this upmarket move because they might still be treating your small customers just as good as they treat the big ones, or they might be paying more attention to the small customer feedback because they just think a customer is a customer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the hardest thing was just to get the whole company aligned on the mindset of, okay, this is where we're going. This is what we need to do. Um, And then, you know, with product stuff, it's not even sexy. It's like they need more, uh, better workflow, better, like more flexible workspaces, better security. Like there's not a ton of product stuff. That's like, Oh, they need this brand new feature that never existed in the product. They just need it to work for a much bigger team. And that sometimes is is even harder than just building like a new inbox feature or something. It's not as, it's not as sexy or interesting for the, for the product team and for the sales team. They're like, build me something cool. Like I want that feature. I can compete against, you know, the other competitors that are obviously terrible, but we need yeah. this one feature. Yeah. Or, or integrations, like you mentioned, Salesforce being the premium. It's like, if you're going to put Salesforce on your premium package, or your enterprise package, it has to really integrate with Salesforce. It can't just connect and like share contacts or something like you basically have to be able to use your product within the Salesforce environment, which is, I mean, a massive technical challenge and undertaking. I I will say I, we are currently, and I hate saying this on the podcast, we're currently using one of your competitors because I eh, I didn't know yet. I know we we signed up for a a long time ago and I don't think it was me, but it was probably me, but their Salesforce integration is garbage. And I'm not going to shout out who it is because I don't want to (laughs) just, you know, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll do a demo after. I'll show you how, how sweet ours is. Sweet. I'd love to because there's so much, so many good things you could do if, you had it, if we had it properly integrated in terms of customizing proposals and pulling notes in and pulling things in. And I, I can't even get it so that it'll, it'll sync. Like when I send a proposal, I can't even get that to sync into Salesforce so I can see that link. Yeah. Or see what people are sending. Syncing is a huge thing, like just being able to have that two-way sync. So if I change something in my product, it also pushes into Salesforce, like things like products and custom fields and all that stuff has to map directly in. It's, it's yeah, there's all so much to Salesforce. It's a beast. It is a beast. And especially the two-way and we, we built the Salesforce integration for one of our products and we, this was in a Salesforce integration podcast, but I can, I, I'll admit it wasn't, it wasn't simple or fun or easy or enjoyable. Yeah. And I think it's good for people to know, even though, like you said, it's not a product podcast, like they should know if they're building a sales team, what's involved because ultimately like the product still has to work for what you're selling. It's just going to be really difficult. And I think that's, that's sort of like, that's a really critical point that I think is maybe a little bit easier to miss is that it's not, it's not just like featured, you know, gunning for feature, 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 feature. It's a lot of what you mentioned, the permissions, the security with the workflow, it's built for enterprise. Right. Yeah. And it's, and you can sort of apply that label to it. And it's like, well, you can go to my other, you know, my competitors and they're the, you know, they're the fun, like nerf site, or you can get like the sort of the, you can step up to the adult software and you can get the like built for enterprise. And that's such a huge competitive advantage. And it's, yeah. it's not anything that's overly complex, like sprinkling some AI sauce on it. You know, I'm sure that helps because that's a nice buzzword, but like <laughs> things that are going to help you not just close deals, but, you know, keep those deals going because the, the administrators can use them. Right. And now you've got, 
you've got another group of users that give a shit about your software that are, are invested in. They've learned how to do all that integration into Salesforce. They're going to be your evangelist when they move on to the next company because they're like, oh, let's rip out this piece of garbage. It can't do this, this, and this that only Proposophy can do. <laughs> <laughs> Proposophy. Proposophy. <clears throat> That's, that's yeah. the name. Yeah. <laughs> Proposify, yeah, no, absolutely. You're totally right. And, and every feature has to go deep, right? It's, you, it's, it's fairly easy to build a product that's, that covers all the bases, has all the features, and then does them all kind of shittily. It's, it's hard to, to build, you know, that, the core set of features that goes really narrow and deep and really solves the needs of the customers. That's what I always say to like our product and dev teams is like, it's not about, you know, calling it a new feature. It's about how do we solve our customers problems? Sometimes we solve it with a bug fix or a UI enhancement. Sometimes it's, you know, a whole new uh, feature or, you know, Swiss army knife. You don't want a Swiss army knife, but sometimes it's a spork they need, but usually it's actually something else. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think that there's just a lot, like if you're in sales and you're competing against somebody that, that goes that like super wide and just a little bit deep approach, I think there's a lot of good language in here that, you know, I would, I, I might listen and steal and use in my own um, talks, especially like for myself, if, if I was talking to myself, like I'm talking to myself 10 years ago right now, trying to figure out how to sell in software. There, there are all these things that I didn't quite fully grasp and wanted to go a little bit deep on these today because I'm hoping that, you know, for the sales, maybe there's a, f a few sales reps that are listening in or sales managers that might be new to selling in software that might not understand that, you know, building a Salesforce integration is super complex and there's a bunch of different ways of positioning it and selling it in the, just how deep you go can be very, very important. And that's mm -hmm. when getting into like a bake off is like, okay, well, you know, if you know, they say, so-and-so says they can do this, well, let, let me show you how our integration works. Can they replicate that and understanding where your strengths in the software are, and then using that to sort of position um, against your competitors. Um, but anyway, yeah. speaking of sort of positioning, you had mentioned that you realized you had a pretty key realization going up market through that came from outbound. Yeah. Yeah. The, the realization was that we had a positioning problem that the positioning that worked for us when we were selling to small customers just wasn't resonating with the, the more up market uh, crowd. So, you know, we went through some exercises as a leadership team and tried to figure that out. And I think a lot of that comes from understanding that when you sell up market, you're, you're almost never sell, selling to one person. You're always selling to a group of people and they all have different needs. They all have different wants and things that keep them up at night. So, you know, when we were selling, selling to small customers, we were basically saying, you know, our tagline that worked or our headline was streamline the sales process or streamline the proposal process, close more deals faster. You know, we still kind of use that a fair amount and, you know, that resonates, I guess, if, especially if you're a smaller company. But when we started to really analyze and segment our, our customers, we realized that the people who are buying our software um, are actually in three different camps if we had to, if we had to kind of group them and then the titles are all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, but like one, for instance, is, um, is in marketing or sales enablement and the things that keep them up at night are not what keeps your sales ops or your revenue ops up, right? Like, so sales ops is all about the, the process and the efficiency and the tool set, right? They own the CRM, they own the data, they want to remove manual work and manual processes from the sales team, which is totally different positioning than the marketer or the, or the enablement person who's like, I hate what reps are sending out to prospects. It doesn't reflect our brand. Uh, it looks like crap and I want to be able to lock it down and control it, but I don't want to be the bottleneck. Right. Which is different than like the sales leader or the manager who's like, I don't like when my deals go cold because then I can't hit my targets and I can't, you know, uh, we don't hit quota. Right. Mm -hmm. So all of those different little bits of positioning are all, you know, very, very tailored to that one audience. And, and that takes time to figure out. A hundred percent. And so you, you actually got there through outbound. Was there a specific moment or was it just accumulation of things? We, we actually found out that there, there was a problem through outbound. And I think it was the way we actually started to figure out what it should be was through talking to leads, talking to customers, um, and just digging deep into those personas to, to try to figure out like, actually, here's one of the best things that we did. It was, it was Daniel, our um, director of sales, who said this was like, okay, you're saying sales ops is, our, is one of our personas. Tell me what they do for a job. Like what's their jobs to be done? And if you asked anybody on the team, we were like, we don't know. So actually one of the exercises was as a leadership team and as a sales team, but we did this two separate times. 
we said, look, everybody look up um, resumes and, and job postings, and then let's talk about what they actually do. Like, what does their day look like? And that was how we figured out that, okay, if, a, if sales ops job is to own the, um, the tools and the process and they want to remove bottlenecks and remove manual work, well, that obviously that's going to tie in better with our tool than just close more deals, streamline, you know, streamline sales. Mm -hmm. If anybody's listening and thinking, what the hell are jobs to be done? Um, I think it was Anthony Alwick, Alwick that wrote the book. Um, there's a Clayton Christensen did a great, if you just Google Clayton Christensen milkshake, um, mm -hmm. I've mentioned it a ton of times on the podcast. So I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing me listen to that. Um, but Anthony Alwick is sort of the godfather and then Clayton Christensen sort of helped become or help make it popular. But it's a really interesting way. If you're a salesperson, it's a really interesting way of thinking about framing up the pains of your customers. Um, I know one of the things I struggled greatly with when I was younger in sales was like, I would just want to sit and spout features and benefits, features, 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 features. And this helped me get a layer deeper. And, and develop a stronger understanding for what my customers actually needed um, to the point where like we've, we've helped tons of companies sort of build up on sales teams. We've actually started doing exactly what you're doing um, as, as part of our onboarding um, do like it. We'd run them through an outbound, outbound validation program is what we call it. And we'll, we run, we end up running like 40 experiments to do exactly what you guys do. We um, we'll, we'll research the, the, um, the job postings of the, the different stakeholders and sort of map out the jobs to be done. We come up with all, the, all these hypotheses. I highly recommend checking out, like that's, it's such a simple and easy hack that just mm. look up, like, hey, you're selling to you know, the CIO, you don't know what they do? Go look at a bunch of CIO job postings and you'll start to realize, okay, there's some, there's some certain things that they're responsible for and you can map those out and then map those to your product. And that is such a powerful exercise. I didn't mean this to turn into a promo spot for us, but I'm- no huge fan of, um, of looking for like little tips like that, that are just, I just want to yeah highlight that because it can be so impactful. Yeah. And yeah, super actionable. And, and like the other thing too, is when you know the jobs to be done or the pain or, you know, what, it, what is it that keeps them up at night? Um, the part of the other part of the positioning if people are looking for a, a good reference. So April Dunford wrote a really good book on positioning and she's kind of a positioning expert. Um, and, and, you know, once you know the jobs to be done, you kind of basically look at um, how do they currently solve it? Like, what are they using? Competing alternatives, but a lot of times it's not a direct competitor. It's some other way. It's usually spreadsheets or um, notes or, or, or Word docs or something. Um, and once you know the competing alternatives, you kind of keep moving down the funnel. Okay, well, why are we better? What, it's not just a feature. It's what does that feature allow you to do that you can't do with the competing alternatives? So all of this work is, is really helping you nail down what that positioning should be. Beautiful. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel bad for not knowing April because she's a mentor to um, a friend of mine who used to work at Predictable Revenue. And when, she, when April launched her new book, she actually sent me a pre-release copy. April, April didn't, my friend uh, Krista did. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put a link to April's book. Obviously awesome in the show notes. I'm going to put a link to uh, Clayton Christensen. Again, if you're, uh, if you've been listening in a while, I'm going to throw that YouTube video there and then just a link to Anthony Alwick's jobs to be done book, uh, which is right there. Beautiful. Cool. We got a couple links in case you want to do some more exploring. All right. So we, we talked about positioning. We've talked a little bit about pricing. So you worked with price intelligently, you moved to the Percy pricing, anything we haven't covered on the, on the pricing side? I don't think so. Like I, I you know, the, I, the surprising thing to us was that it's the pricing doesn't just impact, okay, you can sell bigger deals. That's great. And like, you know, we were able to now sell 20 K or 50 K deals that we wouldn't have been able to before under the other pricing, but even the smaller, uh, plans actually, we noticed there was a, a bump in just overall conversion to paid. So if you're not a SaaS company, it's actually kind of easier if you're a SaaS company that either does one or the other. We're sort of in that weird, you know, hybrid, awkward teen year where we're like still serving really small customers and trying to target bigger ones. Yeah. Um, but we've noticed even a bigger conversion on those small plans, better retention on, on those plans. So it's amazing how much of an impact pricing has if you get it right. It, it can touch all aspects of your business. Man, absolutely. Um, and I don't have any more to add other that you or Patrick haven't already added um, other than to say definitely something to pay attention to. 
Um, so when it comes to, so pricing is one thing um, and, and having a strong pricing strategy is obviously super helpful, but it's nothing if you don't sort of get the sales team on board and teach and not because you almost have to reteach them how to sell. You almost have to and not teach them how to sell, but teach them how to sell proposophy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's proposal five. I'm just doing that yeah, to grind a bit. <laughs> People are going to go out there, start calling it that even more. Yeah. Yeah. So what, you know, what changes did you find you had to make with your sales team or what education, you know, to, did you, did they need to help feel comfortable with the new pricing? This, this is, I think a really surprising takeaway for people was that, um, when you, when you start being able to sell these bigger deals, so let's say it's per seat like us and you go, Oh, cool. I found this lead. They've got a, you know, 500 person sales team, you know, even at our, a discount, we're still, this is a big deal. It actually is really difficult to sell those when, especially when your brand isn't firmly established in the mid market or the enterprise, what has worked amazingly well is land and expand deals and um, selling proof of concept and those types of things. That's, that's actually been our strategy that's worked pretty well is, okay, we know there's 500 seats there and we would love to get those someday, but let's get 20 of your people in today, start using it, start figuring out how to make you successful. This is where customer success comes in, which is a whole other topic and, and building that team concurrently with the sales team. Because if you can get that right and basically teach the sales reps, sell, sell a small deal, figure out some kind of a a commission split or whatever it's, but basically you don't need to bring in the big fish right away. Let's do a slow burn. Let's look at this over two or three years and figure out how we can get 500 seats in that account three years from now. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, we're talking about the difference between, you know, a $12,000 a year deal and uh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year deal. Yeah. How do you, how do you strike that balance with your reps and say, you know what, don't, don't swing for the fences and, and try and get that lock in that large deal up front, just, just sign them on 20, just sign them on a POC. Um, you usually will put the actual um, end date for the POC. So that's the key, right? If you're going to sign in the 20, say this is a three month POC. And once you hit certain benchmarks and milestones, you're automatically locked in to bring in another hundred or, you know, sometimes you actually don't want to sell all 500 because this, the customer success will break at that point or the product will break. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as you do a commission split and accounts towards their quota, and basically you treat the, the sales rep fairly so they're not getting punished, um, they're generally really happy with that. Okay. And so make it the just, sales cycle shorter too. For sure. And it's so much easier closing a, a POC deal that scales up than it is to say swing for the fences and try and go 500, try and close those 500 seat deals. Mm. Um, especially because... You, there's just so much work that needs to get done for that 500 seat deal. And they're probably going to ask, do you do pro services and this and this and that? Uh, oh, pro serve. I mean, that's a whole other topic. That's something else I didn't think we were going to get into. And, uh, you know, it was like done with agencies, done with pro serve. Oh, guess what? We sell to mid market and enterprise. Now suddenly you have to tack on some onboarding fees or some implementation, get look at like sales engineers who can, you know, spin up accounts for, for demos. And that's a whole other, a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to touch it here other than just a collective nod that, yep, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, so what else, what else needed to change other than the sort of the commission structure on the sales team? Um, for the sales team, what else needed to change? Um, I mean, sorry? Your, your metrics, like did their metrics change a little bit? Did you, did you adjust this? Like it sounds like you adjusted the comp plan. Is it? Yes which, which helps. I imagine there was a, a, a related adjustment in, okay, the metrics that you're expecting. So it's more, more geared heavily towards upsells as opposed to just like sign the big one-off deals. Well, I mean, I think it was really complicated before when we had the bigger team um, because they were getting commission fully on upgrades, which I wasn't a big fan of. I thought customer success should have been doing that. Mm -hmm. um, they were kind of just looking at, okay, revenues, revenue, where we'll find it wherever we can. Um, wasn't a good long-term strategy. It did help us, you know, with a few growth numbers at certain months, but really it's as soon as you can, I would say like get the sales reps only getting commission on net new, of course, unless it is land and expand and there's, it's sort of thought out as a strategy from the beginning, but in general, customer success should be getting trained up on how to call, you know, those old grandfathered customers and figure out how to uh, put them on a new per seat plan and, you know, basically just split it out that way. Cause otherwise tracking and commissions gets really complicated. 
So that's one thing we did, you know, not commissioning on monthly plans anymore, get making sure it's annual only, or if they had special permission, maybe six months, just locking in some rules around the sales and, and commissions, I think helps a lot to make it easier to track. Um, and then in terms of like where we set the quotas, it's really hard when you're still sort of figuring it out. So you've got to kind of pick a number you think you can hit, but oftentimes you'll get the sales team won't even close that. So just having in like um, accelerators on the commission so that, okay, if they do really well, they'll that extra 20% in quota, they get, you know, a, top, a, a much higher percentage on the commission working in spiffs. So we've like figured out how to like, have these little contests where it's like who, who makes the most cold calls in a week, they get this special spiff um, working in those kind of things. Cause really it's just about like trying to get momentum in place and try to keep morale from being too low when sales have a bad month or they don't have a lot of pipeline. It's like, that's, that's kind of some of the hardest thing is just to keep their mindset really good. Mm -hmm. For sure. In, in keeping them sort of their eye on the, on the game. Um, yes. If you're, yeah, if you're constantly sort of battling to fill up your pipeline and your quota is, you know, 5x what you can likely hit or even like 120% of what you're actually likely to hit and you're a, you know, you were an A player at your last role, it's got to be pretty discouraging. And so, you know, there's always going to be those ups and downs with a business when, you know, you're, when you're going through a change like this, like there's no absolutely perfect way to, um, yeah, there's no perfect way to, to map it out. And there's no way to know ahead of time, okay, exactly what you're going to sell. And the best you can do is your best guess. Yeah. Like, and when you're figuring it out, you have to put more of the um, less, less punishment on the reps for not hitting quota. Because I mean, if you've got an established sales process and you've got a hundred reps, who can all do this. Yeah. You know, you can fire the underperformers, but when you're all just sort of in it, you know, trying to figure that up market play, it's like you should put more of the risk and onus on the company to have its shit together than, than, you know, really punish the reps too badly. So we even do things sometimes like topping up OTEs if they haven't closed it because we know it's like they're good. They're really good on demos. They know how to close. It. They're, they're doing, they're working the pipeline. They're, they're prospecting. There's just no leads in their pipeline. You know, th th their pipeline is just crap. Mm -hmm. um, then you can do that stuff. If they're not putting in the work and they're lazy, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Right on. And it sounds like with the new approach, with the land and expand model, customer success is now right in the front seat. They're almost, it sounds like they could almost be out closing your, your sales team. So can you talk to me about what that change looked like as you went up market? Well, again, we, we needed to find the right leader, which took a few tries. We had tried to hire internally at the beginning when we just decided to even build customer success. We just had support at the time. Um, and then, you know, we had somebody else sort of try to try to run it didn't work out so we actually it took us a few tries we found um connor on our team uh who joined the company and and he's really been instrumental in sort of really just showing the rest of the company this is what customer success actually is it's not you know it's not tier three support or tier one support i don't know whatever the highest tier is um it's actually a a, a, a function of growth it's like it, when you close a new deal with a customer, what does that onboarding process look like? How do you get them to success really quickly? How do you monitor the signs for churn? And then how do you make sure that they're doing QBRs and, you know, uh, checking in before renewals and really like proactively going out and expanding those accounts? It's, it, you're right. I mean, sometimes customer success outperforms sales. And that's, as a founder, that's not a bad thing. Obviously, it's not great if you're uh, running a sales team. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think that that's a part of it, right? If, if that's the strategy of the business, then as the sales team, you know, who cares, right? Like that's, you're doing what you're supposed to do and you're supposed to, you're, you're quoted on, you know, closing these POCs and as many of them as possible. And as long as the metrics and commissions and, you know, whatever is are sort of in line with that, then, you know, it's okay that sales doesn't always need the glory days. If that's the strategy of the company, yeah, if that's, what's working for you, like, let's do it. Well, yeah, like the other funny thing too is how much, uh, I think this is in, in the book as well, like predictable revenue, impossible to inevitable is that an up market company, they're not going to be getting as many leads from marketing anymore. Um, whereas at one time our reps relied a hundred percent on all inbound leads. Every single deal that ever came in the company came from an inbound lead of somebody who started a trial, downloaded a piece of content, you know, uh, re requested a demo. Um, we're now in that sort of pivoting um, process of like where we go, okay, actually sales reps need to go find their leads. 
marketing is, is building brand and it's building context and awareness and equipping the sales team with tools, but marketing is not going to bring you leads. And even just getting your sales reps into the mindset of like, don't wait on marketing, go find your own leads is a whole other transition that has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we've been fortunate in, in some ways because we've, we've had a similar, um, similar journey, right? The book, the website, the podcast, they all generate lots of traffic. That traffic leads to lots of leads. Um, and we've, we're kind of hitting that stage where there aren't, or we've hit that stage this year where there aren't enough leads to go around between all the sales reps. And so, you know, fortunately we've had an outbound team in place for a while and now we're really ramping that up because you got to, you know, you can't just sit there with, you know, underutilized account execs. You need your closers focused. You need their calendars filled. Yeah. And, we, we kind of cheated a bit. We're like, okay, well, we need to fill our calendars. Let's just go hire a couple extra people on our delivery side and we'll, and we'll use them on the, on, for our rev team. Um, yeah. I know not every company has that luxury, but that, that was sort of our, our cheat, our hack. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, we're in a very similar boat. That's great, man. And so talk to me, I want to talk about sort of what, what went well, what went poorly, but let's, let's start with the bad news. So through the whole process, what, what do you think went, uh, went poorly? What were some of the mistakes that that you would do differently next time? Um, I mean, so much of this stuff is hindsight, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, doing it next time. I think I would have I, doing it next time. I'd have the experience to know what to do. So it's, it's a bit of a catch 22, but I think like uh, definitely the idea of like trying to finding the right leader, Le the, getting the right leader in place is probably the number one decision as founders, or, you know, if anyone listening to this is a founder or a CEO, um, that makes all the difference. And it doesn't always come about through, you know, big company experience, like we touched on. It matters like who actually has the knowledge and the skills and the right, um, you know, the right chops to actually build this from scratch. So I think that is, is probably the biggest takeaway that I would have um, done differently. Right on. And then what, what would you say, what do you think went well? Um, I think you know, we, we, we've been lucky to find really good people uh, here in Halifax, um, really good product team, really good customer success and support and marketing, like really just the whole thing. Everybody was, was pretty quick to, to want to adapt and change with the market. And I think, you know, getting the bigger you get, we're not a massive company, we're about 80 people, but like like a company even of that size, still the ship turns a little bit slowly and, and it's still about a year, 18 month process to even have everybody moving to the same direction. Um, and I know that like every company faces that. It's super easy as a, st a startup with like four people because you can just quickly adapt and pivot. Um, it's really hard the bigger the company gets. That's, that's totally fair. And just want to sort of cap with, you know, where, where are you now? Why don't you talk, can you talk to me about like, what, what are some of the positive sort of changes that have come from this whole process? I think overall, like this, it was worthwhile um, because at least for us, and I'm sure a lot of software companies, it's, it's the same thing where there's always competitors entering your space and it makes, it always is going to chip away at growth in some way, right? There's always going to be a competing alternative the move to up market, the move to mid market actually pushes a lot of those smaller competitors aside. It's, it's, it's fairly easy, you know, quote unquote easy to build a startup that goes after tiny customers. That's what we did. And that's what most people do. Um, but most can't follow you when you start to serve those bigger companies and most startups will never start there. Right. Um, so I would say it's been worth it because now we've, we've put in our time, we've, we've got our battle scars, We've learned what we did wrong and where we fixed it or are fixing it. Um, so now it's just a matter of kind of pouring gas in the fire and just trying to figure out that repeatable process um, and trying to sort of build something that's really scalable. So I think that's kind of the journey we're on now. It is working. It's shown, I mean, our biggest growth segment is the mid-market customer. Um, our, the numbers, the churn, the, the ARPA, the ACV, all of those numbers are trending in the right direction. So we just need to double down on it now. Right on. And I, I do want to say just, you know, before we kind of wrap here, the, um, you did write a blog post about this. I love how transparent you are, um, not just in the, in the blog post um, and all the numbers that you shared and everything we were able to glean from that, but also in the book that you wrote. Do you want to take a minute and just tell people about, uh, about your book? 
Yeah, sure. So um, I wrote a book earlier this year. It's the first book I wrote, um, and it's called Free Trials and Tribulations, How to Build a Business While Getting Punched in the Mouth. Um, and that book is kind of like a, a bit of a personal memoir because of some personal things I went through uh, in my life around, you know, um, leaving a religion and divorce and, and um, uh, tragedy and all this kind of stuff while building Proposify. And so it's kind of a combination between memoir and um, business book with, you know, some practical takeaways on building startups and really just trying like a little bit of a, uh, somebody called it a kick in the ass, which wasn't really what I meant it to be, but, uh, I think they meant it in a good way. Right on. And last question, if anybody's looking to, to get in touch with you or, or you know, say they want to, they want to check out Proposify, or they, they're looking for a, you know, a job in Halifax or, um, just they're thinking of going up market and they want some advice. What's the best way they can get in touch with you? Yeah, so I'm I'm super active on LinkedIn. Um, Kyle Rack R A C K I is how you spell my my last name, and uh, my personal site is just kylerackey.com. If if people want to check that out, a lot of the blog posts that I read around startup stuff and SaaS stuff is on my personal blog, and then the company is Proposify, not Proposify, P R O P O S I F Y dot com, and people can check out the product if they like. We also have a blog on on sales stuff too. If people want to um, check that out. Right on. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Colin. Appreciate you having me.